Funding for this program was provided in part by Brigham Young University Religious Education. Our keynote address tonight is going to be delivered by a dear old friend of mine. I say old in the sense that we really have known each other for many, many years. In fact, it was 40 years ago this spring that we both graduated from the same high school. We're both Provo High Bulldog alumni, and we graduated from here, and our paths went different directions, but it's been fascinating to see how often our paths have crossed. Uh, Paul, after doing his uh, bachelor's degree here, stayed around and came back again and worked on a master's degree. And then in the same year that I left Brandeis University, that's a Jewish school out in the Boston area, to start my teaching career here at BYU, why Paul came to Brandeis University to work on his PhD. So uh, we are two of the rare Brandeis PhD granting uh, faculty here at BYU. So we both got our, our PhDs there. We've also crossed paths often in the high Uintas. We both enjoy backpacking and hiking through the Uintas, and we have uh, crossed paths on occasion there in the high country in the wilderness area. We also both are currently serving as bishops. He is the bishop of the Meadowwood Ward. Also, he is, uh, was the coordinator for the Near Eastern Studies program at the Kennedy Center until May 97, and then when he was appointed as Associate Dean of Religious Education, why then I took over as the coordinator for Near Eastern Studies. So we've followed each other one way or another and crossed paths many, way, many times over the years. We're in for some tremendous insight this evening about Psalms 22. We're very familiar with Psalms 23, but Psalms 22, with its beautiful messages and some of its prophecies, deserves our rich attention, and we now turn the time over to Paul Hoskison to help unlock this chapter, this psalm of Scripture for us. Paul? Thank you very much, Victor, for that kind introduction. Uh, we are old friends. We're getting old together, and that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? To uh, to grow old together and to have all those wonderful fond memories. Victor was actually around when the Psalms were written, and we appreciate that. <laughs> For faithful members of the Church of Jesus Christ uh, during New Testament times, the only written testament that they had available to them was the Old Testament. It was not therefore surprising that the New Testament, particularly Matthew, quoted frequently from the Old Testament and used its messages to give weight, meaning, and understanding to its witness of Christ and His work. In my own personal scripture study, I've also found the Old Testament to bear a faithful testimony of our Messiah, our Savior, and of His gospel. Of particular interest to me over the years has been the Messianic text of Psalm 22. And parenthetically, let me state here at the beginning that I will use the names and titles Christ, Jesus, Messiah, Savior, etc., interchangeably throughout this talk. To introduce this psalm, I begin with a quote from the New Testament. While on the cross, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is Aramaic for, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Most subsequent Christian readers of the text have simply uh, believed that Christ was expressing his anguish during the process of uh, uh, crucifixion. Latter-day Saints have the benefit of apostolic insights. Elder James E. Talmadge ascribed a theological significance to Christ's anguished cry on the cross. Quote, In that bitterest hour, the dying Christ was alone, alone in the most terrible reality— 
that the supreme sacrifice of the Son might be consummated in all its fullness, the Father seems to have withdrawn his, the support of his immediate presence, leaving the Messiah of men the glory of complete victory over the forces of sin and death. End of quote. Subsequent Latter-day Saint commentaries have tended to follow Elder Talmadge's direction. In addition to, and certainly not in place of, these previous LDS explanations of what Christ intended with those words, I would like to suggest an additional reason. Christ was attempting one more time to convince those on Golgotha that he was the Savior of the world, the promised Messiah. The words that he uttered on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, constitute the opening words of Psalm 22, a psalm that testifies remarkably of Christ's mission. Except perhaps for the soldiers, all those who heard him speak those words would have realized that he was quoting from the opening lines of Psalm 22 and would have realized that thereby Christ meant all of Psalm 22. A closer examination will help us understand the importance of Psalm 22 as Christ's last mortal testimony of himself. In general, Psalm 22 is a messianic prophecy of unparalleled detail, both in content and in doctrine. Indeed, it is one of the most compelling prophecies in the Old, Con Old Testament concerning the Messiah. In the first part of the psalm, verses 1 through 21, the poet speaks as if he were the Messiah, and many of, mentioning many of the events of the last 24 hours of his life, especially details about the crucifixion. In the second part of the psalm, verses 23 through, uh, 22 through 31, the poet describes in uh, beautiful terms the result of Christ's atonement, but shifts from speaking as if he were the Messiah to speaking of him in the second and third persons. A closer look at each verse follows. After the opening words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Verses 1 and 2 continue. Why art thou so far from helping me, from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and I am not silent. This is an introduction to the passion of Christ, as the suffering and crucifixion is called by our traditional Christian friends. We learn from modern revelation that his extreme agony in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross caused even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore and to suffer both body and spirit. On the cross during the day, he cried out the words we quoted above and received no apparent answer. The night before the cross, while suffering in Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt, and received no apparent answer or relief other than, as Luke records, there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. In the end, Jesus drank the bitter cup and finished his preparations unto the children of men, seemingly alone. No wonder then that on the cross, though strengthened by angelic ministrations the night before, he cried in the words of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? None of this suffering was unforeseen. It was all part of the plan of salvation from before the world was created. And therefore the psalmist can say in verse 3 that even though Christ would cry out in agony, he would also say, quoting from the psalm, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. With these words, I believe the poet is expressing the concept of thy will be done by having the Messiah acknowledge that his Father is holy, that he is worthy of the praises of Israel, and therefore that Christ would partake of the bitter cup and complete his assignment. Though, uh, though this particular incident, um, in this particular incident, God did not remove the bitter cup this time, indeed could not remove it, in times past, God had always provided a way for his people. Verses 4 and 5 express this concept along with the idea of trust. Quote, Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver him, them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. Certainly these verses refer, among other incidents recorded in the Old Testament, to the events of the Exodus, 
when the Israelites, after leaving Egypt, cried unto God for deliverance, he did deliver them on several occasions. All who place their trust in God will receive the help and the aid and the strength that they need to weather the challenges and the vicissitudes of life, usually not by having the obstacle removed, but rather by being given the strength to climb over or to get around the obstacles. In giving this testimony of the Messiah, Isaiah said of him in his writings, He hath no form nor comeliness when we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. According to Isaiah's testimony, no one would be attracted to the Savior because of his physical good looks. In the next verse, in Psalm 6, uh, Psalm verse 6, also brings out this point in a manner that only expresses, uh, that not only expresses how the people would view Christ, the way that Isaiah had described him, but that also hints at the fact that despite appearances, Christ the Messiah was and is the King of Israel. Verse 6 reads, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of man, and despised of the people. With this phrase, the psalmist captures the essence of Isaiah's expressions, no beauty, despised, rejected, and esteemed as not. It may seem strange that the psalmist would refer to the Messiah of Israel as a worm, but the use of a worm as a description for a royal people is not unprecedented in the Old Testament. For example, God himself refers to the chosen people as a worm. Isaiah 14, or 41 verse 14 reads, Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. End of quote. The word used here in Hebrew for worm, tolat, is a variant of the name for the type of a worm or grub that was the source in the ancient world of the color scarlet. Because the dye made from this worm was very expensive, only the richest of people could afford clothes that were dyed scarlet in color. Lamentations 4.5 makes a graphic contrast between those who are used to wearing scarlet, that is, the rich and the noble, and those living at the other extreme of the economic spectrum, those who lived on manure piles. I think Lamentations was being a little bit um, euphemistic there. Therefore, the color was often associated with royalty. By using the word worm, the psalmist can capture both the lowly esteem Christ's contemporaries would have for him, and also the concept that Christ was a king, the source of royalty. In the Gospel of Matthew, the soldiers who mocked Christ before his crucifixion understood the significance of the color scarlet. Quote, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe, and when they had played it, a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Of the three items the soldiers used to mock Jesus, the scarlet robe, the crown of thorns, the reed, only the robe was an actual symbol of royalty. The reed was a mock scepter, and the crown of thorns was a mock crown of splendor. Thus, Matthew's mention of the scarlet robe as a symbol of royalty seems intended to draw our attention back to the irony of Psalm 22 with the worm and the source of the scarlet color. That is, Christ, though esteemed as not by his contemporaries in his own lifetime, truly was associated with kingship. As the worm was the source of the color of scarlet, so was and is Christ the source of the royalty that lasts through the eternities. The psalmist was also aware of the taunts and teasing that Christ would have to endure on the cross. In the language of Hebrew poetry, he prophesied of the, of the Messiah in verses 7 and 8, quote, All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. End of quote. Notice how the gospel accounts bring out and emphasize the fact that the passers-by the thieves who were crucified with him, and the chief priests and scribes and rulers 
all contributed to the fulfillment of this messianic prophecy. In Matthew's account, we read about the passers-by who mocked and taunted Jesus about trusting and, and uh, being delivered. Quote, and they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. Similarly, we read in the Gospel of Luke how the people and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. Likewise records Mark in his gospel. Also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, he saved himself, or he saved others, himself he cannot save. And with even more sarcasm, they continued, let Christ, the King of Israel, descend from the cross that we may see and believe. Mark records also that they that were crucified with him reviled him. Despite the pains and suffering and derision Christ would experience on the cross, the psalmist recorded the faith and trust that he held in his Father's love and support. Verses 9 and 10 of the psalm state, quote, But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. These words express Heavenly Father's watchful care over Christ. The psalmist indicates that even before Christ's birth, God was with him in the womb. God helped him come forth, and God gave him hope even before he was weaned. Nevertheless, despite God's tender care and love for the Messiah, the Messiah cries out to his father through the psalmist in verse 11, quote, Be not far from me, for trouble is near. There is none to help. It is possible that this is a reference to the arrest of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane and of his subsequent trial and scourging and crucifixion, during which he was deserted by all of his apostles and disciples, perhaps not without design. Nevertheless, there was no mortal at his side who could help or succor him through this difficult experience. We feel, therefore, in his heartfelt cry to his Father, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help the anguish he must have felt. Of the trial and crucifixion, the psalmist records in verses 12 and 13 the Savior's thoughts. Quote, Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. Bashan, the first, a, a, a place first mentioned in Numbers 21:33, was one of the territories on the east side of the Jordan River and was called the land of giants. The Bible attributes to Bashan beauty and fecundity. However, in addition to its grandeur, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and other prophets employed Bashan as a metaphor for the proud and the mighty who shall be made low. Therefore, it is likely that the bulls of Bashan that uh, is mentioned in Psalms symbolize at once all that the world considers beautiful and important, and at the same time, the apostate Israelites who were proud and thought themselves mighty. In the particular case of Christ, the bulls of Bashan probably represent the political and religious leaders who in their pride and apostasy would not recognize the promised Messiah and who would, according to the psalmist, with a quick shift of metaphor, seek Christ's life as would a ravening and a roaring lion. After Christ's trial came the crucifixion. Here the psalmist gives us graphic details about the suffering and agony that Christ experienced on the cross. In verses 14 and 15 we read, I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me unto the dust of death. When the psalmist writes of the Messiah that he is poured out like water, he is probably referring to the incident upon when the soldiers, under orders to hasten the death of the three people who were crucified, pierced Christ's side with a spear, and forthwith came thereout blood and water. The expression, my heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels, is possibly the poet's way of describing the cause of the fluid in Christ's chest cavity. 
It is also possible that all my bones are out of joint refers to the strain and probable joint failure that ensues from crucifixion. While on the cross, Christ said further, I thirst, no doubt as a result of the trauma caused by crucifixion. There is no better imagery for extreme thirst than the psalmist's term, a potsherd, a broken piece of pottery. In those days, everyday pottery was not glazed. Therefore, if you put some water on a broken piece of pottery, a shard, the drop would be soaked up almost instantaneously. You would never know that there had been water on it. Severe dehydration also causes the tongue to swell up and the mouth to become dry so that the tongue cleaves to the jaws. The psalmist, after mentioning that the Messiah's bones are out of joint, that he is poured out like water, that he experiences extreme dehydration, reports that the Messiah is brought into the dust of death, referring to the fact that Christ had been brought by the crucifixion to the point where he could die, that is, to the very gates of hell. Yet Christ could not be forced to die by any outside power. No man or combination of men could ever take his life from him or kill him. As he himself said, I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Christ was not killed by crucifixion. In fact, we know from reading Josephus that people could survive crucifixion if rescued from the cross within a day or two. Rather, Christ freely gave up his life on the cross as a sacrifice for us. Because he'd been brought unto the dust of death, his death would be a vital part of the atonement. In the next verse, verse 16, the psalmist states, For dogs have compassed me. Dogs in the Old Testament are not only unclean animals, but they are also used as a metaphor for something base and unclean and just low. An example of this comes from the well-known story of David and Goliath. When David approached Goliath with no obvious military weapon, but rather with the staff and the sling of a shepherd, Goliath, thinking that David was mocking him and scorning him, cried out, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? In other passages of the Old Testament, um, dogs are often compared with swine, a decidedly un-Israelite animal. In addition to being a base animal in the Old Testament, dogs in the New Testament are a metaphor for Gentiles. Therefore, the dogs in Psalm 22:16 probably refer in general to base persons, to those who are not true Israel, and possibly even to the soldiers who encompassed him and crucified him. In the same verse, the psalmist records of the Messiah, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. This most likely refers to the Jewish leaders, quote, the chief priests and elders and all the council who, get, who sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, end of quote. They had Christ arrested, tried, and sentenced to what they thought would be an execution. Thus, by legal process, they sought to enclose him and thereby to silence him and to do away with him. Last of all, in this same verse, notice the psalmist's graphic description of Christ being nailed to the cross. They pierced my hands and my feet. Verse 17 begins, I may tell all my bones. Tell is an older English word that means to count, from which our word teller, as in bank teller, comes. Therefore, the meaning of the phrase is, I may count all my bones. This reading of the verse conveys the fact that all of his bones were there and that none of them were broken, thus fulfilling the requirements of the law of Moses, that the Passover offering of which Christ's sacrifice was the last and the event to which all of the previous sacrifices were to point, that it be whole, complete, and unblemished. The second phrase in verse 17, they look and stare upon me, is an apt description of what the bystanders no doubt were doing. In verse 18, the psalmist reports that they part my garments among them and cast lots on my vesture. This prophecy is so exact that both Matthew and John mention the fulfillment thereof. John's record is more detailed than Matthew's and is therefore worth repeating here. Quote, 
Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. The next verse refers to the death of the Messiah, but not of the usual mortal death. As stated earlier, Christ was not executed. He voluntarily gave up his life on the cross. Therefore, the psalmist records in words that recall the opening of the psalm, quote, be, But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. For clarity's sake, I quote the rest of the verse from the New English Bible. Deliver my soul, myself from the sword, my precious life from the axe. Save me from the lion's mouth and my poor body from the horns of the wild ox. End of quote. This is a reference to Christ's suffering on the cross and his appeal to help of his Father, much as he did in the Garden of Gethsemane the evening before. But the appeal is not to save him from death. The appeal is to allow Christ to go through with the sacrifice and complete the atonement, including the resurrection, expressly so that death will lose its sting and the grave will have no victory. As Moroni stated the case, the death of Christ bringeth to pass the resurrection. In accordance with the psalmist's plea, Christ's soul and body would not remain in the lion's mouth or on the horns of the wild ox forever. After Christ voluntarily gave up his life as a ransom for our sins, thus completing the suffering and death and, and, uh, the atonement, for the atonement on our behalf, Christ took his ministry to the spirit world. His death was not the end of his work. It was just the end of the mortal phase and the beginning of the next stage. Therefore, the Messiah's plea was not to spare him from death, but rather not to leave him in the jaws of death. With the atonement complete, the psalmist seems to switch voices. Previously, through verse 21, the psalmist spoke as if he were the Messiah. Indeed, it may be that many of the descriptions up to this verse in the psalm apply both to the mortal life of David, the psalmist, as scholars have pointed out, as well as to the Messiah's sojourn on earth. However, beginning with verse 22, it seems that the psalmist begins to make a transition from first person through second person and on to third person when speaking of the Messiah. The reason for this change may well be that the rest of the psalm, which I believe contains a description of the post-mortal mission of Christ and his eternal glory, contains no parallels with the mortal life of King David. Thus, the psalmist must now relate Christ's visit to the spirit world, the judgment, and the eternal rewards of the faithful, and he must describe these events as if he were watching them instead of personally experiencing them. Verses 22 and 23 introduce this transition uh, through a clever use of the first person uh, narrative to speak of the Messiah in the second person, and then shifting again, addressing the audience in the second person, and the Messiah in the third person. The psalmist states, with a bit of commentary on my part, I, the poet, will declare thy, the Messiah's name, unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation I will praise thee, O Messiah. Ye in the congregation that fear the Lord, that is, that reverence the Messiah, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob glorify the Messiah, and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. Then in verse 24, he makes the final transition to the third person. For he, God, hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the Messiah. Neither hath God hid his face from the Messiah. But when the Messiah cried unto God, God heard. God hearkened to the words and the works of Jesus, the Messiah, in order to bring about Christ's resurrection and eternal life, and through the atonement, the resurrection and eternal life of all mankind. Returning now to the specific words used by the psalmist, the congregation mentioned in verse 22 could well refer to Christ's visit to the spirit world, wherein there were gathered together in one place an innumerable company of the spirits of the just, to whom Christ preached the everlasting gospel. All those who would have accepted the gospel, who would have reverenced the Lord, and who would have taken upon themselves the covenants of the gospel and become part of the seed of Jacob, had they been given the opportunity in this life, 
will have that opportunity when Christ opens that missionary work, as the psalmist uh, makes clear. And when they accept it, they will praise God and will fear, that is, worship the Lord. It seems to me that the psalmist seamlessly moved from these verses to the judgment and the eternal life. We are accustomed to making sharp divisions in this mortal life between the spirit world and the judgment day and the other phases of our lives. However, seen from an eternal perspective, the seams we create may be more due to our desire to organize and categorize than any real division. In reality, our existence is, from our pre-mortal life to our eternal reward, one continuum without great divisions or seams. In this manner, the psalmist can continue his description of the judgment day and eternal life without drawing the line between spirit world and eternity. Poets have, after all, license to wax poetic and can, therefore, uh, uh, relate the story in a much more perfectly uh, um, apropos mode than those who would tell a story straightforward. Thus, allow me to read verses 25 through 31 with a bit of interpolation and a generous amount of commentary on my part. Verse 25. My praise shall be of thee, O Messiah, in the great congregations of the spirit world and eternities. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. That is, I will make good on the covenants I have made in the presence of those who worship the Savior. Verse 26. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. That is, the meek who inherit the earth as their eternal reward will have all their righteous desires fulfilled. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart, the heart of Messiah, shall live forever, and so shall everyone else because of his sacrifice. Verse 27, All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. Indeed, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess before Jesus Christ. Verse 28, for the kingdom is the Lord's, it belongs to Christ, and he is, the, he is the governor. He is the king of kings among the nations and peoples. Verse 29, all they that be fat upon the earth, that is, those who are rich and noble on the earth, shall also eat and worship Christ. For surely all they that go down to the dust, that is, to the grave, shall bow before Christ, and none can keep alive his own soul. All of those who have died will eat at the banquet table of the Lord and worship him, not because of their own merit, for no one has the power to save themselves, that is, to keep uh, alive his own soul. Only Christ can save souls from the consequences of the fall and from the effects of sin. Verse 30, a seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. When we have accepted Christ and bowed the knee and worshiped, then we become his seed and are accounted as Christ's children or generation. This is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy concerning the Savior, that, quote, when thou shalt make the Messiah's soul an offering for sin, the Messiah shall see his seed. That is, Christ shall behold and acknowledge those who, because of the covenant which they have made, shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. Verse 31, then they, everyone whom Christ has saved, shall come and shall declare his, the Messiah's righteousness, unto a people that shall be born, that is, unto a people that will resurrect, and thus will be born into the eternities. That Christ hath done this. Or in the words of the Book of Mormon prophets, they shall be constrained to exclaim, Holy, holy are thy judgments, O Lord God Almighty, because Christ hath spiritually begotten them. They have become a new people, a people that shall be born into eternal life, for Christ hath done this. In conclusion, Psalm 22 contains one of the most powerful witnesses of the Messiah, of his work on the earth, and of his accomplishments for the eternities. As a treatise on the atonement, it stands unique in the Old Testament. Yet this psalm is an example of more than prophetic detail about Christ's crucifixion and atoning work. When Christ on the cross quoted the opening lines of Psalm 22, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was calling attention to this prophecy of his life, of his death, 
and of his work for the salvation of mankind. Those who stood at the cross and who knew the psalm would have recognized immediately in it details that were unfolding before their very eyes on Golgotha. Thus, his words would have been one more witness to believer and particularly to unbeliever alike that the events they were witnessing were a fulfillment of prophecy. I believe that Christ, with tender compassion and consummate love, despite terrible suffering, was reaching out one more time to tell the house of Israel who he was and what his death would mean. For the Gospel of Matthew, these words on the cross became Christ's last testimony of himself as the mortal Messiah. Not only to those who personally witnessed the final act of the Atonement, but also to all those who would hereafter read Matthew's account. His testimony is powerful and is true. The psalmist, in expressing this testimony, has blessed us, the readers, with his sublime and poetic witness of the Savior. I bear witness also that he lived, that he died, and that he lives again. He leads and directs the work of this kingdom in these the latter days. And I say that in his sacred name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. amen. For more information on this program, visit our website at broadcasting.byu.edu.